There is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the absence of the sacraments, the holy name of Jesus can be a great remedy, a uh, very powerful remedy for uh, venial sins committed, for making reparation. Um, also can help us to desire Holy Communion more readily. And so even, even before, you know, when our Lord died for us, I mean, the Holy Name was there. You can imagine Our Lady and St. Joseph every day, you know, anytime they would, we would call out to our Lord, they would always do so with reverence and how much they were growing in holiness every single time they said that name. So, uh, God was saving. That's what the Holy Name means, right? So it's not... You know, Jesus saves, because I would say God saves, saves, right? So, um, his name is salvific for those who do not have uh, again, the access or reason to the sacraments. Uh, it can help to make a good act of contrition before dying. And then also, um, again, we look at the, how much, even at that time, anyone who would have called upon him during his life with reverence was uh, growing in, in holiness and uh, um, better disposition. Okay. Now, today, on this feast of the most holy name of Jesus, we remember the privilege and the necessity of being Catholic. Some might try to distort the meaning of the text and say that others not Catholic who call upon the holy name can be saved as they are. Yet Christ himself warns in the Gospels, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. They forget that part. <laughs> Catholics and non-Catholics cannot both be doing the will of the Father while worshiping him in such diametrically opposed ways. For instance, whoever sins, you forgive or forgiven. Right? Those who retain are retained. Who believes that who doesn't? Right? Again, your Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. And then again, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Not everybody who calls upon the name of Jesus believes any of that. Right? But if we don't believe that, then we're not doing the will of the one who sent him. And we're not doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. Okay. Therefore, the holy name of Jesus can only truly be called upon when it is done in spirit and in truth, per St. John's Gospel. The spirit means reverence, and truth means believing in Jesus as he is, and not as one made in one's own image and likeness. If either of these is lacking, then the name of Jesus does one no good. But it actually then falls under the breaking of the second commandment. Thou shalt, shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And to do so is not exactly doing the will of the Father in heaven. Right? So, the holy name is not to be taken lightly. Uh, it is one that must be said, of course, with reverence, but also with proper faith, with proper belief. Because that only then can we actually be calling upon him and not some distorted image of him, which if we're talking about a distorted image of God, that is, I mean, that's, that's of itself blasphemous, right? So there are those who could be calling upon the holy name in a blasphemous way, not even realizing it. Right? So um, it's important that you know, we remember the privilege of what we have and that um, it is God who has called us for the sake of his son to salvation, so that his son would have those to worship him in spirit and truth, those who would actually uh, do what God wants. <laughs> and uh, so, something just to, to consider. On a more spiritual level, we should often think to ourselves how many times each day 
each hour, nay, each moment, the most holy name of Jesus is being blasphemed by thoughtless people, Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Such are falling into hell like snowflakes, because there's no one to pray to make reparation for them. It's not just those who are committing other crimes, criminal acts, but those who, in a slipshod way, say the name of our Lord. Remember 19th century France, La Salette. The famine that was there, right, was happening because, of course, of Sundays were not being kept holy and the blasphemy, the way that our Lord's name was being dragged through the mud by ungrateful men. Okay. Now, we cannot receive Holy Communion every moment or stop such sins from happening directly, but if such sins cause God's judgment to arise against his people, even in this life, then how much more good can come to souls by invoking the holy name with faith, reverence, and reparation in spirit and in truth. So we can, even without knowing what sins are being committed each moment against this, this name of all names, of all names, we can be repairing for those sins and restoring the honor of God that is offended by such blasphemy. Whenever we hear the holy name used in vain, we should immediately invoke that sweet name of Jesus with devotion. See if the devil sticks around or not. <laughs> this goes not only for real life encounters, but also in movies and other forms of entertainment. The holier we become, the more any slipshod or irreverent use of the name of Jesus, or of God in any way, will disgust us and arouse our indignation. The holy name is the holy name all of the time, and not just in real-time scenarios. To use the Lord's name in vain is always a sin, no matter what the situation. You know, if you're playing a bad guy in a film, there are other ways to play a bad guy than using the Lord's name in vain. <laughs> uh, and Hollywood does that quite deliberately, because they hate him. <laughs> and we must love him, and... We must oppose such, um, such blasphemy, such, such sins against the faith. There are saints who made a covenant with their eyes never to look upon anything immodest. Maybe as part of our New Year's resolution, we should promise careful making vows, because get vows we become uh, <laughs> very accountable for with God, uh, much more strictly, but we should at least promise to make a covenant with our ears, never to listen to any blasphemy whatsoever. Easier said than done, I know. <laughs> but we can and should apply this to all curse words as well, but especially blasphemy. Should we inadvertently hear it, prepare for it immediately. And if it is via the media, you know, entertainment, reject the whole thing as evil without hesitation. Again, there are times we could all point in times when we haven't done this. But really, we should love the holy name. We should have such a fear and a reverence for that name that if it's used in such a way, break it. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? Um, that is the spirit of the saints. Phineas, in the Old Testament, saw God being dishonored. Not through blasphemy per se, but through sinful actions. And he just he put them to the sword. <laughs> okay, so, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, now, we're not necessarily called, you know, we hear it, you know, to take a sword and, you know, cut someone with it or something with it, but with an act of faith, an act of reverence, we already repair. We're actually helping whoever it is, and otherwise it doesn't have a chance, right? By our act of reverence, we can make up for their sin because we need to love them as well um, and as part of our mission. So we can make use of such things. Okay. It is these types of sacrifices that help us to renew with determination our baptismal promises. Otherwise, in some small way, 
no matter how small, we are compromised. We do not have to be committing a sin to displease God. Their sin is not ours, but it will harm us if we do not act against it. Okay. Think of Our Lady's indignation. Our Lady is sweet, as gentle, as feminine as she is. When there's blasphemy, her eyes <laughs> can imagine. Just, just It would frighten us to see so sweet a lady, the one full of sweetness, angry at the way her son is being dishonored. We should pray for that spirit. Another more natural example is the keto diet, <laughs> something that I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, I actually did it for a few weeks, and I should go back to it. I am saying it publicly, right? Uh, <laughs> when one holds to it strictly, that which has otherwise been liked, whether it be the gluten or the sugar, which neither which is really good for us, becomes specifically distasteful. Like, why did I ever like that, right? Um, otherwise, it is craved and takes, it tastes, excuse me, very pleasant, while it weakens our body, including the natural defenses. While nobody here craves blasphemy, we do crave the sources that so often produce such filth. Okay, so part of our sanctification may very well be the type of spiritual diet that makes distasteful that which we depend upon too much for our legitimate need for recreation and relaxation. A greater sense of fulfillment and a more tender conscience awaits. And then there is the epiphany, a little Christmas often called. If you somehow miss Christmas the first time, you get another chance. It's, there's another octave. It's already a little bit sad because, man, we're just preparing so much for Christmas to come, and now the octave's already over, but there's another one coming. <laughs> and this one, basically, it's, you know, first time the shepherds, now the magi. Same place, right? The fresh. Uh, stable. So, the church wants us to try again, right? To, to renew our devotion, to renew our love for our Lord in the stable, and to call upon His holy name with reverence and put ourselves there. And imagine what the Magi did, and just how they did that. Okay. Just as the star of Bethlehem led the three Magi to heaven on earth at the stable, so the light of faith leads us to be to the vision of heaven. The Magi had faith in the prophecy of the newborn king and firmly held to their conviction until they got to the promised fulfillment. They walked by faith, not by sight, until they arrived. Of course, it is the same for us. We must never take our eyes off of the star. Apart from that star, which is the Catholic faith, all else may be darkness. All else is darkness. The darkness which represents the world that knows Christ not. The star is always there, whether our eyes are there or elsewhere. <laughs> the sun, which represents the church, is not only eclipsed at present, but we're in the darkness of night. The sun's on the other side of the world, right now, it's somewhere else. So we need that star of faith, and we need that star of Bethlehem more than ever to keep us going on the path toward our Lord. Okay, both in Bethlehem and also at the cross, and ultimately to heaven. The Holy Magi also represent the spirit of detachment from worldly wealth in spite of their vast riches, acquired riches. They brought nothing to the world and they take nothing out of it. Once they saw the star of Bethlehem, all they wanted was to behold the infant king of kings. Nothing else mattered. They were the precursors of the holy men and women like St. Francis, uh, St. Philomena, how many others who were otherwise rich in this world's goods put that all away. St. Philomena's case, she was you know, martyred, and in the case of St. Francis, he was martyred in spirit, and he received a stigmata. Okay. It is this spirit of detachment that is so necessary to invoke the holy name with proper reverence and contrition both on our behalf and on behalf of others. So that, however much or little we may possess, with detachment from wealth or the desire thereof, coupled with the love for our Catholic faith, we can learn how to invoke the most holy name of Jesus with increasing reverence and effectiveness for our own spiritual lives as well as the prevention of sins in the world, particularly best. 
And we will love doing it because we're fulfilling a big part of our purpose on earth. Our eyes will become open to the good things God desires for us, the truly good things he desires from us, and not the things we tend to give to ourselves. And we find then ourselves having less and less time, we may find ourselves, excuse me, having less and less time for the things that to this point we have loved too much, and if we're honest with ourselves, we will not even desire anymore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.